Welcome to Chatham House. I'm Robin Niblett, the director of the Institute, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here this morning um, for a meeting with Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter, as I think you all know, is director of policy planning at the U.S. Department of State, uh, where she will be uh, talking with us uh, on the quadrennial diplomacy and development report, uh, this new document which has been developed uh, under her leadership as the kind of executive director of putting this together on behalf of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, and uh, we're going to have a chance to have here her thoughts on it, a few questions between each other, and then over to you uh, in the audience. I do want to thank you all for coming in at this time in the morning. Um, I was explaining that uh, in the case of, of London meetings, um, given the centre of London, in many cases, uh, is not full of British people because in many cases they have to commute in from the outside. Getting our members together at sort of 9, 9.30 in the morning is sometimes uh, requires a fair amount of travel on their part. So thank you very much indeed uh, for coming in this morning. Uh, but I know you'll all be looking forward to the uh, discussion we're going to be having uh, in a few minutes. Um, Amory Slaughter is somebody who's particularly well known to many of you here um, from her academic background. She was Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs um, at Princeton University before taking up her current position at the beginning uh, of the administration of Bar Barack Obama. Um, she was also a professor there of politics and international affairs. And uh, she went to Princeton after having been a professor for international foreign and comparative law and the director of graduate and international legal studies at Harvard Law School. Um, uh, I noticed, uh, Amory, that you got your JD from Harvard Law, your AB from Princeton, but luckily your MPhil and DPhil from Oxford <laughs> University. So, um, so I'm respectable. It's a nice balance, I think. <laughs> That's all I'll say about it. It's a good balance. Um, but she is a, uh, I'm not going to say prolific author. She is somebody who's a thoughtful author who has written a lot. Um, somebody who, uh, who's... Uh, thoughts uh, and ideas uh, were taken up by many people uh, as they thought about what this administration might do and to see you take up this position as head of policy planning uh, was something that uh, I know filled a lot of people who've been looking at America's future role with great interest uh, and we're delighted that you've been there and put together this QDDR that we'll get to hear from you uh, all about it uh, and then we'll turn over to the audience. This meeting is on the record. And if you could please make sure that your mobile phones are switched off, that would be fantastic. Then we can have an uh, uninterrupted meeting. Amory, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. It is always a pleasure to be at Chatham House. And indeed, I have been coming uh, to Chatham House since the summer of 1981 when I commuted from Oxford to Chatham House almost daily to do research on my MPhil dissertation. I was never at this podium at that point. Of course, I was in the audience, and I've had the pleasure of coming back a number of times since, but it's particularly nice to be able to come as the director of policy planning, and above all, to come with a finished report that I can talk to you about. Uh, so as you can see, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, uh, it's about 150 pages. I thought I might start reading it, and we would just <laughs> take it from there. Uh, it is... Uh, it's not an ordinary Washington report. That's the first thing to know about it. There are many reports issued by the government, issued by uh, think tanks. Actually, the State Department itself rarely issues reports. But there have been many reports issued about how the State Department should reform itself. This report is quadrennial. Indeed, we will be asking Congress to require us to uh, do it in four years and every four years thereafter. We'll, we have to ask Congress to make us do it because I don't think anyone, having seen how difficult it was to do this, would do it voluntarily again. <laughs> it is based on the Quadrennial Defense Review, which the uh, Department of Defense obviously does every four years and has since 1990. Congress also required a Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, and the first was done a year ago. There's a Quadrennial Intelligence Community Review and soon to be one in the Department of Energy. So it, it, it has to be implemented. That's, the, that's the, the most important thing, because in four years we have to come back and see how we did. Uh, we have to say this is what we recommended and here's the progress we've made and are we going to continue on those recommendations or are we going to shift course. Secretary Clinton sat on the Armed Services Committee at, at, when she was a senator and saw the value of the Quadrennial Defense Review, both because it really is a strategic document. It requires us to step back, look at what we think is most important in global trends, 
ask ourselves what capabilities we need to be able to carry out the policies we adopt in light of those trends, and asks us what do we need to do today to be prepared for where we think we need to be uh, in a decade. So it is really a strategic document, and thus uh, policy planning is the natural place uh, to spearhead it. But it's also a very political document, and that's important to know in the current budget environment uh, with a Congress uh, that is partly controlled now uh, by the other party, from my perspective. Um, <laughs> I am a political appointee, so I can say that uh, with no problem. From Secretary Clinton's point of view, one of the great values of the Quadrennial Defense Review was when the Department of Defense came to Congress to ask for its budget it was able to point to an overarching strategic review that then guided its annual budget requests. And it was able to justify, if not every nickel uh, of its budget, at least the broad categories in light of those priorities and able to explain precisely what it was going to do uh, with the taxpayers' dollars. That is not something the State Department and USAID have ever done. Uh, she thought, and I think rightly, that if we are to increase our budgets in the way that is necessary, we are going to have to change our planning and budgeting and justifications. So this is, uh, as I said, a strategic document, but also a very political document. With that background, let me turn to the substance of the report. It is called Leading Through Civilian Power, and that is uh, the overarching theme of this report is that in the 21st century, diplomacy and development have to be the first face of American power. That is not in any way anti-military. We are, indeed, a great deal of this report talks about partnering uh, with the military where necessary and certainly being supported by our military. But it does say that given the nature of the problems we face, uh, most of which are not susceptible of military solutions, given our own values, given how we think we can be most effective in exercising the leadership that we think is necessary to address many of these problems, the face of American power has to be civilian. So that is the starting point. The second important point is the way we define civilian power. This is a report issued by the State Department and USAID, so obviously we think civilian power uh, includes the State Department and USAID, our diplomats and our development professionals. But we take it further. Civilian power in this document means civilians who work across the federal government. There are many civilians working for the Department of Defense, but even more critically, the civilians in the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the Department of Energy, the Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Commerce, the Treasury, the Department of Agriculture. Indeed, I took 20 pages of comments on the final version of this report from the Department of Agriculture, which has a foreign agricultural <laughs> service and a lot to say about what we do around the world. This notion that civilian power includes all those civil and foreign servants who work across the foreign government in international activity is actually recognizing a phenomenon that every government in the world uh, with a su substantial international uh, activity has been grappling with at least for the last decade, if not the past two. Indeed, I wrote a book in, in 2004, which I had been started researching in 1994, talking about the proliferation of uh, government bureaucracies and judges and legislatures in the international space. That Obviously, in the economic arena, the finance ministers really have their own policy. Uh, and uh, in many ways, they, they were the pioneers, all the financial agencies, of working with one another. But the health ministers, the justice ministers, the energy ministers across the board are all engaged in work across borders because that's how they have to do their work. Indeed, in the United States, they do not think of themselves as domestic agencies. When we talk about development, we had a presidential decision directive uh, that asked us to review U.S. development policy. Sixteen agencies were around that table as development agencies. We think the U.S. Uh, agency for International Development is the lead development agency, but it's certainly not the only. And as I said, in the diplomacy arena, the negotiations with all these other agencies about energy diplomacy, about who leads in global health, about uh, who really should be leading in police training and, and homeland security issues across borders. So this document embraces the collective ability of all these agencies to work across the board. 
Many foreign ministries faced with similar issues have tried to ignore the international activity of their fellow agencies. Many have tried to compete with their, that activity, and in the United States, we've developed our own police training capability in the State Department, which the Justice Department is less than thrilled about. This document says we're going to embrace it. This is, a, this is a fact of 21st century life. It's a fact of government in a global economy. We need to recognize that. We need to actually recognize the tremendous asset that is, the relations that our Department of Health and Human Services has with health ministries around the world is essential. If there's a global pandemic, it is not going to be simply the diplomats who are going to be able to tackle that. We also have a critical role, but it's, it is a role that has to be exercised together with those other agencies. So again, leading through civilian power, it's a much more expansive uh, concept of civilian power. It does also say, however, and this is really the third overarching point, that in a world in which civilian power is so broadly defined, in which all these different agencies are working with their counterparts abroad, there does have to be uh, leadership and a strategic framework within which all these agencies work. So the final part of the overarching frame is that this document recognizes the State Department and the, US, and the Agency for International Development as the lead diplomatic and development agencies and says that we develop the overall strategic plan, both the diplomatic engagement and the development uh, plan, for countries around the world. And our ambassadors are to act as CEOs of multi-agency missions in implementing those plans. We're not going to be able to do that effectively if we don't engage other agencies in the planning. This is not a document that says we direct what they do. It is a document, though, that says American diplomats, American development experts see the whole. We're the ones who see the connections between all those different issues, and we're the ones who understand how that fits into a national geopolitical strategy, a regional strategy, and a global strategy. You, some of you may be wondering, where is the National Security Council in all this? Uh, and of course, this document was carefully negotiated, and the National Security Council uh, ran the interagency process. Of course, where the president is directly engaged in an issue and in a country of, with respect to Pakistan or Afghanistan, or indeed last year uh, with Haiti, then the National Security Council plays its coordinating role. But what we're talking about is the relations with 190 countries day in and day out, uh, which cannot possibly be run all from the White House. But when you have no one designated in charge, it means every agency can effectively pursue their own course. And that both can cause conflicts and certainly uh, misses many synergies. So that's the overview. It's leading through civilian power, broadly defined uh, with the State Department and, and the Agency for International Development as the leads. There are then three major chapters, one on diplomacy, one on elevating development, and one on conflict prevention uh, and, and response. And a final chapter on more administrative details, which I'm sure you will want to read in great detail, but I think I will not give you this morning. In the diplomatic chapter, there's a great deal about how we want to make this interagency conception of civilian power a reality. To be able to implement this document, we had to get come down from the 10,000 foot level, and there are some very specific recommendations uh, that really go to the incentives for our foreign servants and our diplomatic professionals, where we have said, if you are going to be promoted uh, up the chain to the uh, deputy chief of mission or chief of mission or mission director if you're at the Agency for International Development, you must demonstrate that you know about other agencies, you know what they do, you've spent time at other agencies, uh, and that you can work collaboratively with other agencies. So we're putting it at the level of individual incentives. We're also talking about things like having our chief of mission be part of the evaluation chain from people from other agencies who are at our embassies. So there's some very specific language on the interagency uh, dimension. But there a couple of other major dimensions in the diplomatic chapter. And one concerns how we're organizing ourselves for what we see as the principal 21st century challenges. And I have a list of six uh, that uh, define, unfortunately, my bedside reading. Uh, nuclear nonproliferation, 
terrorism and violent extremism, the stability and prosperity of the global economy, climate change, global epidemics, resource scarcity, particularly energy security, and of course the specific conflicts uh, that we are engaged in around the world. If you think about the world in terms of those problems, we have a State Department that has been uh, originally regionally organized and then functional bureaus added depending on what was particularly important uh, in a given decade. But as we looked out, we realized we really see two big clusters of issues that have to be addressed on the functional side. One are what you might think of as global systems. Uh, we have a department, uh, an undersecretary for global affairs. However, the economy is not part of global affairs, which really doesn't make any sense. If you're thinking of global, the globalization and, and the affairs that arise from it, it has to start with the economy. So going forward, we'll have an undersecretary for economic growth energy resources and the environment. And the Bureau of Energy Resources is new, so that tells you something about where we are putting our priorities. Energy resources includes energy security, but is beyond that. It also includes access uh, to energy. Those, uh, that Bureau will work very closely with the Agency for International Development and the Department of, Ag of, of Energy. So those uh, uh, bureaus will be put together. You might also note that it means economic <coughs> Uh, affairs and the environment are in that those bureaus are under the same undersecretary. There again, those are very important trade-offs. Really, you can't do environmental policy effectively without taking account of access to energy and sustainable uh, economic growth. The other set of bureaus essentially addresses human security. We will have an undersecretary for civilian security, democracy, and human rights. This is a very significant change going forward. If you believe, as I certainly believe after two years in government, that bureaucratic organization and incentives drives, of course, a lot of where we focus. What this is saying is that we are putting together all the bureaus that address the ways in which we have to protect individuals on the ground. We have always had and will continue to have a, an undersecretary for arms control and international security. That is where the START treaty was negotiated. Uh, and indeed, we've proposed a new bureau for counterterrorism, which is likely to be no, located uh, in the, under the undersecretary for uh, international security. But human security means all those issues within states. So we'll have a new bureau for conflict and stabilization operations to address uh, conflicts, hopefully conflict prevention, which I'll talk about shortly, in fragile states. Our Bureau for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, which is effectively addressing all the issues uh, in Mexico and Central America, in West Africa, global crime will be under that undersecretary. But importantly, those security bureaus will be directly connected to the Bureau for Human Rights uh, and Democracy, thinking about how we protect individuals through law and then the Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration, which is really our Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs, which means providing the ba meeting basic needs of individuals in distress. So we are, this is not so novel on this side of the ocean. Uh, it, it's not so novel uh, to the north in Canada or in Japan. Obviously, in places like this, we've been talking about human security for certainly a decade. But from the perspective of the State Department and how we then work uh, with the Agency for International Development, indeed with some of the things that are happening in the Department of Defense and all those other agencies, this is a very important shift. The third er area of note uh, in the diplomatic chapter is a much greater focus on regional and multilateral affairs. And if you have been following the, many of our diplomatic efforts, particularly in Asia, you will have seen a much greater emphasis on regional organizations. We have spent a lot of time uh, working to uh, build up uh, the East Asian Summit to announce our intention to join the East Asian Summit. And indeed, the President, uh, the Secretary was there this year essentially to recognize we need to be able to work through regional organizations to address many of the global issues we face. Uh, again, in Asia, we've been trying to create an organization that can address security and economic issues with the same group of countries, the Southeast Asian nations, Australia, Japan, India, uh, and uh, obviously Korea, uh, and now Russia and China. 
In Africa, if you look at the Côte d'Ivoire or any of the recent African crises, uh, the importance of the African Union, but also sub-regional groups uh, like ECOWAS or the East African Community. Latin America, we're a little slower off the mark, but we, are, we would love to see the reform of the Organization of African States. Uh, and obviously this means uh, both looking at, at parts of the world that are following the example of the EU in various different ways, uh, but also in terms of our ability to work more effectively with the EU. So there are a number of very specific recommendations about how to increase our ability to act regionally and to connect our bilateral diplomacy to multilateral diplomacy. Finally, there's a section on engaging beyond the state, and this is really some of the most creative work we've been able to do uh, in policy planning, where we have been using new technologies uh, to advance diplomatic goals. This is often referred to amusingly, if not derided, as Twitter diplomacy. <laughs> But it's much more than that. Yes, it means we have blogs and we, uh, the secretary, ha uh, or somebody I should say, is twittering uh, on, from the secretary's plane or tweeting. But it really has much more far-reaching uh, implications than that. It includes things uh, like taking delegations of high-tech executives to countries like Russia, Syria, Brazil, Iraq, that has resulted in everything from an app that allows pregnant women in Russia to see what they should expect every week of their pregnancy, just as any of us, or at least any of the women in the audience, uh, might uh, consult uh, a book to see if your preg pregnancy is progressing normally, to an app that allows Kenyan farmers uh, to determine when their cows are about to calve, uh, which is very important if you are a Kenyan farmer. Uh, to uh, the agreement of Google to put the, the treasures of the Iraqi Art Museum, uh, which was, as you may recall, uh, horribly pillaged uh, when we invaded Iraq, to put those online so that there's a virtual museum for the world as well as the actual museum. I will be leading a delegation to Sierra Leone and Liberia in, uh, in March all of women high-tech executives to look at how we can use mobile technology to help empower women in those two countries and more broadly. So engaging beyond the state is public diplomacy, uh, but it's also using new technologies. And finally, it's a much more systematic engagement in public-private partnerships. The national security strategy of the Obama administration mentions public-private partnerships over 30 times, which is really quite extraordinary for a national security strategy. And this is, again, there's some very practical recommendations about how you enable our foreign service and civil service officers to do this. That's the dip diplomatic chapter. Uh, the next two chapters on, on development and conflict prevention and response. Elevating development was one of Secretary Clinton's principal charges to us in uh, launching the QDDR. Indeed, when she testified before Congress as uh, uh, in her hearings to become Secretary of State, she talked about smart power, she talked about connecting hard power and soft power, but she focused specifically on making development an equal pillar with diplomacy in our foreign policy. So her conception, and you see it again in the emphasis on human security, is that going forward, of course we engage in the critical government-to-government -government negotiations. There are any number of places, obviously, as she travels around the world, where that is absolutely essential. So this isn't an either or, but it says in addition to that kind of traditional diplomacy, we also have to focus on the conditions that affect ordinary lives, that we can't address any of the issues we, we face, from violent extremism, certainly to uh, climate change or global pandemics, but even economic issues, unless we're at really focused on the conditions that affect people's lives. And that's largely development and different kinds of diplomatic programs uh, and projects uh, within countries. So elevating development has been one of her signature issues. And if, what it meant in practice was rebuilding the Agency for International Development. The aid had lost 40% of its personnel since 1992. Uh, during uh, the last administration, it had lost its policy shop. I can't tell you how many foundation executives told me when I came into office that they would happily fly to London to talk to DFID, but they would not fly to Washington to talk to USAID. 
because we were a contracting agency. We were not doing innovative thinking in development, and we weren't doing development ourselves. We were basically passing money from Congress through to contractors uh, who, as my colleagues in the Agency for International Development would say, designed the programs, ran the programs, and then evaluated the programs. <laughs> Not a great way to be a global thought leader in development. And honestly, we have looked extensively at DFID, which really is a global thought leader. And one of the things the QDDR does is to restore the Bureau of Policy, Planning, and Learning to USAID and to restore enough budget autonomy that the, the administrator for USAID can set his budget and can hold people accountable for actually implementing it. That said, that budget still has to be approved uh, by the Secretary of State as part of the overall foreign affairs budget. So unlike DFID, it is not a completely autonomous agency. It's an independent agency under the Secretary of State. And her, our conception is really that these are two connected, but nevertheless separate, uh, pillars of our foreign policy alongside defense. Other areas in which uh, we're shifting our development policy, and here we're implementing the President's policy directive on development, is to focus more on specific areas uh, so that we're not a mile wide and an inch deep. We're focusing on food security, on global health, on climate change, economic growth, democratic governance, and humanitarian assistance, and across all of that, a focus on empowering women and, and girls. That may sound like it covers the waterfront. It actually does not. There are a number of important programs. You might take programs in education or in water. We're still going to do, but that's not where we're going to be investing most of our resources. And that means we'll have to be partnering much more closely with DFID, with international organizations, with other governments, because ultimately, uh, obviously, these are critically important issues, but we'll be doing some in depth, and we hope at a world-class level, and we'll be looking to other countries and organizations to do other issues. And finally, a much greater focus on techno technology, on research, on really trying to address development challenges at the front end, either through new technologies or through applying existing technologies specifically uh, to development problems. And Michael Kramer, who's a leading development economist at Harvard, who's uh, invented concepts like odious debt uh, and really looked at how you apply technology uh, uh, creatively to developing country problems, is now the head of something called Development Innovation Ventures at USAID. ID. And just seeing him as the face of USAID in Washington think tank meetings signals a new era in our development policy. The last chapter focuses on conflict prevention and response. And here again, as we look forward, or as we look at the world today, there are some 50 states classified as fragile states. And we could have a long discussion about those 50 and whether there really should be 30 or whether there should be more and which countries should be on that list. But this is very clearly a phenomenon that will be with us for as far as we can see. The issues that we have to address in those states for security reasons, for economic reasons, for regional uh, reasons are often of great concern to us. They require a special expertise. Obviously, when conflict actually erupts, you're working in a conflict within a state, not between states. But even more importantly, we want to be focusing on preventing those conflicts. Now here, we had a coordinator, we have a coordinator for uh, reconstruction and stabilization. That was an office set up uh, in 2002 or 2003. But that was an office set up to create a civilian capability to work alongside troops who are already on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's very important, and we're, we have 1,000 civilians on the ground in Afghanistan now. But we are not assuming that that is the paradigm going forward, certainly not uh, that kind of conflict on that kind of scale. More, more importantly, if you're starting from the perspective of civilian power, you don't start from troops in the field. You start from trying to prevent that conflict from erupting in the first place. You don't start with Iraq and Afghanistan. You start with what we're trying to do. And when I say we, it's not just the United States, the EU, and many others. Uh, what we're trying to do in Sudan, what we're trying to do in Yemen, what we're trying to do in Kyrgyzstan, what soon we may be needing to do in Tajikistan or in Mali. S countries where you can see fissures, 
uh, where you can see conflicts on the horizon. What capabilities do you need on the ground, assuming you are invited by the government? This is not something you send in without uh, the government, but where clearly you need to strengthen institutions and you need to engage uh, in everything from election monitoring to community reconciliation. This is a growing body of knowledge. It's a young field, but if you talk to diplomats in this city or in Washington who are in Rwanda, who were in the, in the uh, former Yugoslavia, who were in East Timor, who more recently have been uh, in parts of Africa, certainly in the Great Lakes, or in, again in Iraq and Afghanistan, there is a body of knowledge being painfully and slowly acquired. And we're, we are creating a new Bureau for Conflict and Stabilization Operations, one that actually is deliberately named uh, to map onto uh, what how the British are organized and how other uh, fellow governments are organized so we can be part of a wider network, to be a center of knowledge, uh, to, to bring together those diplomats who have been in those countries, to gather their knowledge and to link to think tanks and other governments uh, who have similarly uh, been acquiring this kind of expertise and international organizations, to start with the knowledge and then be able to deploy uh, smaller teams of civilians who come from the State Department or, a or USAID, but also from across the government to be on the ground very quickly and in response to either crises or what we see as imminent uh, crises. That bureau, as I said, will work very closely with the Department of Defense and with USAID, and it is under the Under Secretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. So the knowledge that we've gained in Mexico or Colombia or Guatemala, which is not fighting an insurgency or a, a civil conflict, but fighting global criminal networks, there are lots of overlaps. And again, connected to building the rule of law, security and justice sector reform, which is absolutely vital, which is in turn is completely connected to human rights and accountable government. All of those uh, put together. So the final uh, emphasis in this report is really building that capability. It will take a good certainly five to 10 years to be where we want to be. Uh, but we're really trying to stand back and think about what we need, not from the perspective of an immediate crisis, uh, but where we think we need to be uh, over the next decade or two. So with that, uh, that is the QDDR. As I said, it's 150 pages. There's much in there that I didn't talk about. But I hope you can see that it really was an effort to do what is fiendishly difficult uh, in government, even when you're in the Department of Policy Planning, which is to get people to stand back and to think about where we need to go, and to do so not simply at the level of grand prescription, but at the level of manipulating structures, changing incentives, uh, and actually implementing uh, what are a number of very practical prescriptions. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emery, and thank you for, for giving such a thorough uh, presentation of what is such a big document. I suppose <laughs> knowing it inside out gives you a certain uh, advantage, uh, but still, that was very precise and, and very helpful. Um, I mean, uh, I'm tempted to start a little bit uh, on the Q&A, and just so you know, we've, we're going to go a little bit over on time if people are comfortable with that. I know I've checked first with, with your staff. We can run to about 10 past as we start a little bit late this morning, so just to give people a heads up. Um, uh, I just wanted to throw in one question uh, at the beginning, and I know a lot of people want to come in um, uh, on your uh, comments here, but leading with civilian power, that was your opening statement and uh, as somewhat of a student of the EU myself and there are others here uh, who've done the, much more than I have, um, civilian power is something you once tended to associate with the European Union. Um, and the way I've understood it, uh, it was almost accidental power. In fact, it's what we had because we didn't have political or security power. Um, and it was perhaps economic, regulatory, some people have talked about a kind of presence effect where people so it was like soft power, wanted to imitate you even though you weren't uh, projecting power yourself. When you talk about civilian power, and as I've skimmed a little bit the QDDR, um, it's much more American. <laughs> it is utilitarian, <laughs> and we're going to do things. Um, and it's a combination, as you said, of diplomacy and development. Diplomacy, though, national interest. Development, again, from a UK perspective, almost not the national interest. I mean, it is in the long term, but we haven't, DFID has tended not to pick always countries 
that people might have put at the top of the diplomatic list, they've been kind of working on a different track. And I just wanted, I know it's a big question or a big thought, but just um, what do you think about this definition as you've defined civilian power, how the EU has defined civilian power? What are these core differences? I mean, can you really combine the national interest drive of diplomacy with this almost sort of accidental power, the more soft kind of power that I, I often associate with, with development and with civilian power? It's a great question, and it is one that permeated 18 months of debate in many ways, uh, in different, different uh, facets. Well, I have to start by saying, since uh, among, all, among other things, Helen and William Wallace are in the audience and have written extensively on the EU and know that my husband, Andrew Moravchek, wrote extensively about the EU and civilian power and actually suggested that the EU should really take care of civilian power in the world and the United States uh, should take care of military power. I love my husband dearly, but we don't always agree. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so and that, was, that did not uh, actually uh, shape our concept of civilian power. Power, but it is certainly true uh, that we were in a position coming in that having started with military power and the tremendous increase in our military power after a decrease in the 1990s and then a, a huge increase uh, in the first decade of, of this century, that we came at it actually sort of backwards. So we had military power. We really, we, we of course approached it originally through smart power, which yes. is a concept developed by many thinkers, Suzanne Nossel, Joseph Nye, uh, and others, where we said, look, you need all different kinds of power. You need hard power and soft power, but even those categories really don't capture the many different ways in which you need to lead and exercise your power. That said, you're right, it is a, it's not accidental, it's a, it, is a, it is an instrumental conception. We're looking at uh, the way we define leadership in the 21st century is very focused on, help, on solving global problems. It's about, it's, a, it's about bringing nations together to exercise their collective responsibility to address the problems we all have to face. That even if we were 10 times more powerful than we are, you can't do it alone. Uh, and that conception of leadership, of, of solving problems, then naturally leads to you to the tools you need. And the military, while still enormously important, it simply isn't the right instrument for many of these issues. So that's where we get civilian power. As you say, then de development and diplomacy. And it's, it's, it will not be a secret to many people in this room. There were many people in Washington who wanted to follow the DFID model, who wanted a separate agency for international development that would be precisely removed from calculations of national interest, who would think about development for its own sake. I don't think there's anyone second to Secretary Clinton in her commitment to development. You know, she, was, she actually saved USAID in the 1990s uh, when the, uh, that, uh, her husband's administration wanted to collapse it uh, into the State Department and as First Lady and as Senator. She has been, uh, she's traveled around the world. She's been a passionate advocate for women's rights, uh, but really for rights of individuals uh, around the world. However, she sees development as a long-term commitment. So this is, this is the immediate difference in terms of how we think about it. We do not see development as a tool of immediate national security interests. Obviously, in some countries, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, we're spending a lot of money. And no, those are probably not the countries that you would choose if you were looking at the countries best suited to take off on the development index. But even in those countries, what we are saying and what we have seen is that simply pouring money in does not get you the results you need from any set of calculations, that it has to actually produce long-term development results. Now, what you do changes pretty dramatically if you're in a conflict situation versus whether you are looking at countries who are really ready to take off in various ways. So we are defining development in terms of doing what you need to do to achieve long-term development results. However, and I think this is perhaps a difference in the body politic, but in the United States, where we spend those development dollars has to be connected to our broad national interests. So, at least from Secretary Clinton's perspective and President Obama's perspective, we are not asking American taxpayers, many from cities that need plenty of development themselves, to be spending money around the world for development for its own sake. We are looking at development in terms of our security interests, 
in terms of our long-term economic interests, which means building strong economies all around the world, and in terms of our values. It is certainly consistent with our values uh, to promote development, but it has to be within an overall foreign policy frame. So as I said, we're trying to build an, a sufficiently autonomous agency that it really can make calculations that are not uh, tied to short-term political calculation, but that is still overall part of a larger foreign policy frame. I think even in the UK, uh, as you well know, this government has continued to increase its yes. development spending, and, and where it's spent, this has caused some, uh, some concern and some commentary, and we might come back to that. And I think your point about America as a country thinking about leadership and therefore perhaps having to take a different approach, wanting to solve the problems, believing it can, again, brings a very different starting point. Thank you. These will be points others will come up with. Let me get uh, uh, questions in. I've already had uh, four people raise their hands. Let me get those, and then I'll go to others. First, and there's a microphone coming. Please introduce yourself very quickly, and let's get as many points in as we can. So. Thank you, Robin. Tomasz Walaszczyk with the uh, Center for European Reform. It's good to see you again, Mary. A question on resources, hmm. if I may. In the uh, sort of mid to late 1990s, uh, the Jesse Helms, Newt Gingrich, and Newt Gingrich Congress cut State Department's budget so badly, abolishing interagencies, as you recall, the Information Agency, for example, that the State Department's uh, know-how, expertise, manpower has atrophied. In fact, within a few years, the military stepped in many of the roles traditionally played uh, by the diplomats. Dana Priest wrote a, wrote a very, uh, very good book on, on the subject. Are you not worried about history repeating itself in, in some ways, especially if, and you may question my assumptions, but I assume that A, um, the United States too will eventually have to start tackling its debt. Uh, we all think, look at this year's budget as, as essentially a stopgap budget, but uh, within a few years there will be uh, uh, presumably cuts in public spending. And the politics of development aid and the politics of State Department budget is very different in your country than it is from here country. Here, as Robin pointed out, development aid is, plays a different role. It was in fact specifically excluded from the cuts that, uh, that uh, the government had to make. In the United States, foreign aid is often the first thing you cut because it's seen as the easy thing you can cut without uh, taking a hit back at home. So are you not worried that within a few years you'll be looking at this plan thinking, great plan, shame about the, uh, the era of austerity that came afterward and about all the subsequent <laughs> budget cuts? All right, three quick answers because I know there are many questions. 11. One, one we can, <laughs> we can implement 60% of what's in this document without more resources. So a lot of what I was talking about in terms of reorganization and how we focus and what aid does with its money, we can do. Uh, second, there has been a major uh, commitment to increase the size of the Foreign Service, and USAID has, has, hand, has hired 1,000 people already and is on track to hire 1,000 more, it, just on current budget levels. So we don't need an increase just at the current level. Uh, but third, the US military is the biggest proponent of this approach. Uh, it is Secretary Gates who gave a speech saying we need to demilitarize American foreign policy. It's Chairman Mullen who has said the debt is our biggest national security interest. They are well aware that they cannot continue at current levels of deployment and uh, uh, simply using the military to, to address all these problems. So they are standing side by side with us saying this is a better investment. This is what we need to do to maintain the military at the level and the, the, the quality we need. We need to be investing much more in development and diplomacy. It's going to be a tough fight. I'm not pretending it's not, but I really don't think it's the same kind of politics uh, as the 1990s or the early part of this century. And it, it'll be interesting to see whether the DOD would be as open to fungible funding, perhaps some of its funding heading over to development as... Uh, DFID is perhaps being forced to be here in the UK to have some of its funding be funged over towards FCO. But well, in any case, um, DOD, I can see fighting its corner. Jeremy Greenstock, and the microphone coming. Uh, Marie, thank you. Jeremy Greenstock, Gatehouse. Um, two, two questions. One, you don't just need resources from Congress, you need attitude. Are you going to get public and congressional support behind this approach? Because the noises we hear on this side of the Atlantic are very different from the exposition you gave us, which, are, which is music to the ears of this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> and second, if you're leading on this as United States, you need people to follow. Did you consult any other diplomatic services or governments in preparing this report? And do you think, do you not think, Anne-Marie, that it's time not just to worry from the United States that other people's defense budgets are slipping below 2%, but that other people's foreign affairs budgets, diplomatic budgets, are slipping down to 0 0.2, 0 0.1% 
uh, of government spending. Uh, what you are enunciating is a civilian power approach and you need other civilian partnerships to be able to do the same thing with you and yet uh, others are taking the accent away from those areas. Don't you need to do some diplomacy on that? <laughs> <laughs> so on, on attitudes, we, uh, I think there is a lot of support for this approach. There's a lot of support uh, in, again, starting with the military, but uh, there, are, we, there are many in Congress who recognize that this is, needs to happen. You, what you are hearing, of course, is what we're hearing from the new Republican majority in the House, uh, which, is, and they, absolutely, the Heritage Foundation has just issued a report suggesting we should abolish USAID. That's a slightly different approach from the one <laughs> we're taking. <laughs> so, and there, there will certainly be some fights. That's the House, it's not the Senate, and even there, once you start looking at budget calculations, if it is true that the overriding goal is to cut the deficit uh, and to maintain our security, then we think we've still got a good platform on which to argue. And one value of this report is Secretary Clinton can say, look, I just spent 18 months figuring out how to do what we do better. Uh, we have made a lot of the changes and the streamlining. And to come back to Robert's point, we are also preparing for a lot of pooled funding on the, on the chance that we don't get the kinds of resources we need. So I, I'm less concerned about attitude overall. You're hearing from a very noisy majority in one, or part of a majority in one, in one house. Uh, on other countries, we, we certainly looked a lot at what other countries were doing in terms of debates on development. That was something we talked about quite a lot. Uh, we did not consult uh, in terms of how we were reorganizing the State Department, but we are very aware of how other nations are leading. But I think the, the most important response to your question is we're not just looking at foreign affairs budgets, not that we don't need to lobby for ourselves and other diplomatic budgets, but what is not changing is funding for, again, our health ministers, our finance ministers, our justice ministers. Those are issues that are absolutely vital from a domestic point of view and cannot be implemented by our government agencies without cooperating with their counterparts abroad. It, that's, you can't cut that. It has to happen. If you are fighting terrorism, if you are fighting global crime, if you're, fi if you're looking at global health, if you're looking at global energy, which you have to do, it's all those agencies. So you could have a much streamlined State Department as long as you had that overall strategy uh, and the ability of the chief of mission to really run the, the mission in the way I'm describing. I'm not proposing a streamlined State Department. I think we still need more, but I, I am saying that it's not the same as just looking at foreign affairs budgets. Thank you very much. And just as I said a minute ago, I'm afraid I can't take any more okay. questions. No, just uh, <laughs> these are important points and good answers, but I've, I've got uh, eight more people on the line. I will probably take people in pairs yeah, now, if that's all right. And no, this is good. We've got, we can go to 10 past at least, and maybe a couple of minutes beyond that. So first, uh, Gideon. Thanks. Uh, Gideon Rachman. Hi. Uh, a variant, really, of Thomas Valasek's question. Uh, the title's leading through civilian power, but if you look at spending, obviously the Pentagon's budget's enormously larger than that of the State Department, and, and even regardless of what happens in terms of uh, cuts, presumably that will basically remain the case. Is it possible to get this shift in priorities that you're talking about without some sort of shift in resources between military and civilian power? And also I wondered about uh, public opinion, because it seems to me that in the United States, the US military really is, is still revered diplomats and, and development agencies slightly less popular. So is this going to be a difficult case to make publicly? Well, I, I, on the, on the, oh, let's take, do you want to take another one? Well, I do, I do, I'm, let's do them one at a time, because then okay. you'll be, I'm, I think each of them is so different. This is, right. yeah. Uh, so I don't foresee a large transfer from the Defense Department uh, to the State Department immediately. And indeed, Secretary Gates, although he thinks we should get much more money, isn't actually volunteering to hand his budget to us. Uh, that is, uh, if you read the fine print, it's fairly clear that that's not his goal. Uh, but again, if you, what you really have to do is read the QDR next to the QDDR and see that the QDR is all about investing in building partnership capacity. So you might say, well, yes, they want to you know, sell arms and build uh, armies. Not 
not so. If you look at the Navy strategy, they're talking about building up rule of law, building up the ability to actually police territorial waters in ways that then leads them to anti-corruption and effectively to development. That means, again, a lot of what we're going to have to do is work with them. They have enormous civilian affairs capacities. You might say, let's transfer that to state. That's not going to happen. That's one reason we define civilian power the way we did. What it does mean is that they will work within a diplomatic and development frame. And they have seen themselves that a lot of the ways they've spent their money has not yielded the results they want. So I, as I said, there's pooled funding. Uh, there's working within a development strategy and a diplomatic strategy. And ultimately, we also call for a national security budget that in the end, really to get the kind of change I think you need in Congress, you're going to need to make the case for a much broader concept of national security and have the Defense Department arguing with you. Uh, the last thing I'll say is there was a poll yesterday that did say that a majority of Americans would prefer to cut the defense budget rather than Social Security or Medicare, which was an mm. interesting finding. Didn't say they'd rather fund the State Department. <laughs> Still, that's all relative. <laughs> Question in the front here, please, microphone here. And then we'll be going over there to Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Duncan Green from Oxfam. Um, from a development point of view, one of the most brave and exciting things is the focus on women's rights. Um, it's, it's come through Secretary of State's message all along. Um, and uh, yeah, the case for it is absolutely um, uh, unbeatable. But I'm, what I'm interested in is the risks attached. So, so you know, it's not so long in terms of domestic politics that not baking cookies was a major political liability. Uh, has something shifted inside the US? And also, what does it do for your partnerships and your alliances working with governments who don't share that view of the centrality of women's rights? You know, what are the downsides to taking such a sort of strong stance? Mm. Um, I do think things have shifted domestically. Uh, I, I'm not going to say absolutely everyone, but you know, we've, we're on our third woman Secretary of State. Uh, <laughs> and the, at that moment, that was before the first woman Secretary of State. That was in the early 1990s, and of course, about the woman who is now Secretary of State. I, do, I really do think there's been an enormous shift. And I think part of that is the evidence. It's just the best investment. When you look at all the data and you're really making the case we need to spend your money wisely, this is where you need to invest. On the second issue, and, and this is a document that talks about integrating gender issues in every part of our diplomacy and our development. It, it, is, it pays attention at every turn. That's just a, 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 a trade-off Secretary Clinton is willing to make. Now, I'm not going to say that necessarily everybody feels the same way and uh, it, well, ha we need to institutionalize it, but obviously there are different ways you push it, but even in many, many countries where this is not a popular message, you find ways to work with women's groups to find uh, th those wa ways even in the government or to use mobile technology or to work with uh, civil society uh, to again, on the case that this is in your national interest to educate and to empower your women, your economic interests, your social interests, uh, and ultimately your security interests. It's not easy, but it's a place we're willing to go. Uh, Alex? Uh, yep. Um, Alex Evans from the Center on International Cooperation at NYU. Um, my question follows on from the second of Jeremy Greenstock's question. What you're setting out is a pretty radical and far-reaching set of reforms to how the US does foreign policy. It's absolutely not business as usual. And given your emphasis on collective action to deal with shared challenges, I guess it follows logically that ultimately you're depending on other governments to carry out similar upgrades to how they do foreign policy. So my question was, which governments you see specifically as really embracing the same analysis and undertaking similar upgrades to how they do foreign policy? <laughs> I would have said we were aligning ourselves with what many other governments, other governments have already done uh, in terms of, again, if you think about a focus on human security, this was something that many governments were doing in the, in the early part of this, this century uh, or the early part of the first decade. Uh, so if I look at, again, the EU, if I look at European governments generally, if I look at Japan, uh, again, these are governments that are giving the, mo the most foreign assistance around the world and how they are allocating their funds. Uh, and if I look at how they prefer to work through regional or multilateral organizations, I see us as actually saying we want to be your partner. Uh, often we have not been there. Uh, and uh, that doesn't say we're never going to act unilaterally, but it does say on a whole range of issues, we're going to 
do old-fashioned diplomacy and work through regional organizations. If you look again at, you know, how, how did we work on the issues in the South China Sea this summer? <laughs> well, we worked very hard with other Asian nations to under a rule of law framework in a regional organization to address those issues. Uh, and it, it's, it's really common sense and necessity uh, as much as anything else. So I, I don't see it as requiring other nations to have a similar upgrade. I see it as requiring us to change to work better with them. Thank you. Um, yeah, Alexia, thank you. Um, morning. My name is Alexia Duten. I'm a research fellow here at the Chatham House for the Centre on Global Health Security. So I'm very glad that you made such a strong point linking global health with diplomacy and power. And my question goes back to um, the US interest. Of course, it's quite obvious to see how global health links to security interests and to long-term economic interests. Now, your third type of interest was um, the values. And that actually think, links back mm -hmm. again to how you see leadership um, and um, how you see engaging with others. And so also hooked on the previous question, how do you see that happening specifically um, in the area of global health? How would, you, how would you like to work with others? And how do you see the American leadership? Mm -hmm. Um, Values, that's something you've written about and a big question. <laughs> and I, I will say that the four interests in the national security strategy are security and prosperity, which is not all that surprising. Uh, the f third is respect for universal values. Note how that's framed. Respect mm. for universal values. And the fourth is international order, something the Defense Department is as passionate about uh, as the, <laughs> the, for, uh, the State Department. I think on the Global Health Initiative, which is one of the two big signature initiatives of this administration, and it will certainly will have to fight for those resources in Congress, if you look at how it's being designed, there are two important features. One is we're looking to countries to develop their own health strategies that we can then support, which is consistent with development best practice around the world. But the other is we're working uh, at least half through multilateral organizations. So trust funds uh, and, and uh, particularly through the World Bank, but not, not exclusively. Uh, and in what we're committing to do, which is harder to do, is to align with other nations and to divide labor with other nations. Again, on the premise that d different nations will focus either on different diseases or, in our case, we're focusing on building health systems. So we're trying to move money that we're spending on, US, on HIV AIDS, not just to treatment, but to building the health systems that will make it sustainable. And as you said, that is consistent with economics, with security, but absolutely, I think, with the basic <coughs> values that people shouldn't die when they've got the treatments to save them. Question here at the front, please, William Wallace. Microphone coming. You can just tell me it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, I just want to ask leadership versus partnership. Um, I've heard here and elsewhere of successive new administrations, new groups come in and say, the United States is now going to lead the world to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to democratize the Middle East in the next 10 years, whatever it may be. It's very welcome to hear you talk about how much you're going to share with others. How do you change the culture of those Americans on the ground all the way through to working in partnership with others rather than saying, here's the United States, you follow us. As it happens, I was talking to someone who's involved in Southern Sudan some weeks ago who was talking about the sometimes very active competition between US agencies and others in what's very clearly a multilateral agency. Is, is that a, a problem for you, that one really does need to get the US into partnership mode rather than leadership mode? <laughs> well, cultures don't change overnight, but I do think it's important to hear how we define leadership. We define leadership, as I said, in mobilizing, convening, catalyzing other nations, and not just nations, uh, public-private partnerships, toward addressing global problems. So the first thing to say is this is not a definition of leadership that where we get out front and you follow, that will not mobilize collective action. It may, it may in some cases, but in general, it really does require an approach of partnership. Uh, so that in some cases, I don't think we see such a big difference. That said, it's also true, though, that Secretary Clinton will say to you, as she goes around the world, people continually say, what are you going to do about it? And our response, you know, if, if, for to say, well, 
you take the lead and will be your partner, doesn't often get things done. Now, so some of this is also, I think, about other nations taking that responsibility. And you hear President Obama talk about responsibility all the time. I often say, if there is an Obama doctrine, it's with power comes responsibility to address collective problems. So, I th but, but for the moment, there still needs to be that catalyst. There does need to be somebody who says, it's our responsibility to do something. There are many Americans who say, why is it always our responsibility? But in the day-to-day -day diplomacy, we have to reconcile that kind of, we're looking to you with the re reality that how we respond determines how effective we are. So what I would say is there is still a sense that we have to lead, but there's a growing sense that we have to lead in a very different way. And that in many of these cases, the only way to be effective is ultimately a partnership. And then it has to be a genuinely more two-way partnership, not just with other governments, but with corporations and, and NGOs who often say, you tell us what you want to do and then you ask for our money. That's not a real partnership. And we're, we're learning that in many different places. As we've hit 10 past 10, and I've got four people right from the beginning that I've, I've kept, what I'll do is I'll group these last four, I'll keep a list of them, and uh, we'll finish up uh, then with your last comment. So first, the gentleman here with a grey sweater, microphone coming, and then we'll just pass the microphone in front of you. Uh, hi, uh, Jack Pegoraro from the European Azerbaijan Society. Mm. Um, I've got a specific question about aid. With this new sort of emphasis on development, uh, it's now been 16 years since the ceasefire between Azerbaijan and Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, this has resulted now in close to 1 million internally displaced uh, refugees within Azerbaijan. Uh, Armenia doesn't have the same problem, but despite this, the aid to Armenia is far greater than the aid to <laughs> Azerbaijan. Um, with, in view with everything that you've said and with this new emphasis on development and aid, is this the type of thing that might be changing uh, perhaps going forward? You pass the microphone just in front of you, the person in front. Thank you. You want me to ask now? Yes, I'm going to get all the questions in because we're already at 10 past 10. Thank you. Right. Michael Stott from Reuters. Uh, Dr. Slaughter, you talked about how you wanted to use new technology to advance American goals and engage beyond the state, and you gave a couple of relatively uncontroversial examples of women monitoring pregnancies and farmers knowing about their cows. But of course, there are other things you can do with those technologies, aren't there? And, and there was an important role played by Twitter in Moldova in the uprising there and in Tunisia as well. And I wondered to what extent American foreign policy sees the use of new technology to uh, seat undesirable, corrupt, or repressive regimes as an explicit goal. I'm glad you said you were from Reuters. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two more. I'm going to take the last, last two questions. Please, uh, uh, yeah, and then come to Catherine. Hi, uh, Federico Reggio from ENI. Um, from a private sector point of view, being from oil and gas multinational, how can a, um, a multinational that deploy already thousands of people in, in, in the fields and spending billions on sustainability project and program can cooperate with this new mm -hmm. vision? Because as you say, just asking, just asking money is not going to work. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we figured that out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And the last question, Katrina. Hello, Katrina Lang from the UK Ministry of Justice. Um, really good to see the emphasis on justice, rule of law. I wondered if we were starting out in Afghanistan now, given your approach you've set out, what would be different in terms of how we approach justice and rule of law? Well, you're lucky I put all these down as a group of last four questions for you. And you can plead. I've only got two minutes left. But, um, <laughs> two minutes. Right? Okay. <laughs> I got them all. I, I think I've got them okay. all. It's the beginning of the day. By the end of the day, yeah. I won't remember. Uh, on Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia, a absolutely, in terms of, of how we're thinking about how to deploy our development resources, you would, you would look at a set of criteria that really look to how uh, able or likely a country is to develop. There are obviously domestic politics also at play, and I don't think any report is going to change that fact, although we have talked about uh, working with Congress to reduce earmarks in various ways. Uh, on, oh no, I said I remembered the second question. No, 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 absolutely, um, on te technologies. Uh, so when Secretary Clinton gave a speech on internet freedom last year, which is something I think was a, a very important speech, she made clear that technology itself is not good or bad. Uh, for, and we, we know that. Uh, there is no magic to simply promoting technology. 
Uh, we are standing for uh, many ways in which we think technology can be used for good, and one of them absolutely is uh, the ability of technology to make it easier for people to stand up for their rights uh, and for accountable government. Uh, so that is a part of our policy and a, a part of our active policy uh, that, so let me leave it at that. Uh, on, uh, and it, yes, so I had the pleasure or the difficulty of actually trying to create a public-private partnership from uh, policy planning. There goes my alarm again. Mm. <laughs> uh, it, it is not easy to do in the State Department. It is not part of the culture, uh, and it frankly legally is very difficult to set up a partnership. We're doing very practical things. We have an office for public-private partnerships. We are setting up templates of different types of partnerships that look like corporate law documents. You can pull it off the shelf, you can customize it, and we are absolutely convinced that a partnership between a corporation, an NGO, mm -hmm. governments, these are how you have to address these problems. And there are countless members of the civic sector and the corporate sector who want to be part of it, who just don't know how to plug in. It's up to us to make it possible for every embassy and for every office in Washington to facilitate that in ways. And we've got some great results, but we've got a long way to go. Last Justice week. Afghanistan. I did say that I remembered the them and I didn't. I have my hubris. Uh, uh, what would we do differently? Well, we would have no more turf fights. They would be completely gone. The, the uh, Department of Justice uh, and USAID and the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement would step forth together. Uh, seriously, the, we, we really would, in first place, we've learned a lot about how you do it. But second, uh, there would be an understanding, I think, in the State Department that we need to use our other ministries. This is probably one of the biggest changes, that the, if we can use our Justice Department and parts of it, those relationships that are gained and the experience that is gained if they work in different countries are to our benefit in terms of our foreign policy. So rather than using contractors, not that we won't use any, we would have a much uh, smaller reliance on contractors in police training and training prosecutors and building the rule of law. Last thing I would say is that also our diplomats across the board will be expected to know much more about how you do this as simply part of general diplomatic knowledge in a world of fragile states. Emery, we're often envious, I think, in, in the UK, maybe other countries as well, about the US being able to draw the best from academia into public service. I think your talk today has reminded us why we often are envious. Really, from my perspective, a superb presentation, hopefully a superb document that people have a chance to review <laughs> as well. Certainly your presentation of it was wonderful. Um, I think it does strike me as bringing really quite a different perspective, or at least a shift of perspective, responding to the outside world and to the limits, perhaps, to US leadership while still responding to the desire for it. The fact that it's quadrennial, yes. as you said at the beginning, is going to be key. Yes, so, oh, it won't be me. In well, I was about to say, <laughs> it looks like uh, you've left a great legacy. Um, and I know the UK, I'm sure, is going to be one of the partners that you're looking for. Yes. Other governments will be as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for staying late and for great questions. Thank you. Thank you.